I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the change in leadership in England, we have with us Max Bergman, who is our Europe program director at CSIS. Max, so great to have you back on the podcast. Great to be with you. So Max, tell us who is Liz Truss and why is she now the UK's prime minister? Well, Liz Truss is a longtime Conservative Party member. She was a foreign secretary in the Boris Johnson government uh, and has had held cabinet positions in the previous conservative government. So she's been around for a while, has sort of paid her dues. And then, you know, when Boris Johnson resigned, it created this mad scramble within the conservative Tory party over who would be the next prime minister. And they, you know, they've, they've it used to be all these decisions were made behind closed doors. There's been some innovation in the UK political system. Labor does something similar where now they have kind of American style primaries and they, what they do is there's a huge number of candidates that gets whittled down. And Liz Truss was the the last woman standing. She uh, was up against uh, Rishi Sunak, who was the chancellor of the Exchequer, essentially the Treasury Secretary. And and it was pretty clear for a while that Liz Truss would win the Tory Party leadership, uh, but she ended up winning it in in sort of closer than expected. It was I think fifty eight percent of the vote she got of just Tory Party members. So this isn't the UK going to the polls. This is just paid members of the Conservative Party. A few hundred thousand people getting to vote. So she comes into office as someone who is not extremely popular amongst the British public, is not extremely popular amongst the conservative parties. The conservative party is, in fact, I think pretty divided uh, and is going to face a whole slew of problems from rising energy prices to the challenges posed by Brexit to the war in Ukraine. So is becoming prime minister at a fairly auspicious time. So do her policy positions track well with Boris Johnson? Is she, will we see departures? What What is she like policy-wise? So I think there's going to be a fair degree of continuity. I think one of the things that Liz Truss has become quite known for is her hawkish stance toward Russia, speaking with real moral clarity when it comes to the challenges posed by uh, Vladimir Putin and by a rising China. And I think, you know, one way to maybe think of her for an American audience is is maybe a John McCain type with a lot of clarity when it comes to foreign policy. And the critique would be sometimes not enough diplomacy, that at times she can be very blunt. There's been some articles critical of her where some Biden administration officials may have balked at some of the the hawkishness of of some of her positions and and her rhetoric. But I think you're going to see a lot lot of continuity there when it comes to Ukraine. There's also, uh, I think, going to be a degree of continuity when it comes to the EU. And I think this is where there was, I think, some hope or people were looking at Rishi Sunak as a perhaps more positive alternative when it came to uh, UK-EU relations. Liz Truss uh, had threatened to kind of uh, uh, pull out of the Northern Ireland Protocol. This is the agreement between the EU and UK over how to treat Northern Ireland in its trading status. This would be invoking Article 16. And she had threatened to do that uh, during the campaign. It looks like she may pull back. Uh, But so whereas concern about EU-UK tension, that's sort of, I think, continuity with the Johnson government. But I think where it's there's a big unknown X factor is the Johnson government fell not just because of the scandals that was erupting in his administration very regularly, but also because Brexit was sort of coming home to roost and the costs of Brexit and the struggles with the UK economy. Well, Liz Truss has to face down some of those challenges, as well as now you know skyrocketing inflation due to skyrocketing energy costs and how that's going to be tackled is a, is not about continuity with the Johnson government, but will require a bit of a new approach. And I think that's where the big challenge confronts her of whether she can chart that new path. Well, that's a really interesting point. I mean, she's inherited an economic storm that's really raging through the UK and doesn't seem like it's going to resolve anytime soon. What do you think the first steps she needs to take to really ride this out? 
Well, I think the first step, and this is something she's already announced, is an utterly massive package to support the British public basically pay for rising energy costs. I saw on, on Twitter the other day a sort of Wheel of Fortune style game where you know you could win a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds, or get your your energy costs paid for. And energy costs it ended up landing on energy costs, and the, the person was incredibly excited. I think sure. that was the the windfall. So the UK public is facing tremendously high energy prices. This is also true within the European Union as well. So her package that I think she's putting forth is to effectively limit the costs that will be paid by UK the UK public. I think that's necessary. And what it essentially amounts to is think of what we were doing during COVID to keep the economy going. The problem is, how do you pay for this? And Liz Truss has sort of also tried to hearken back to the Margaret Thatcher uh, supply side economics, tax cuts, kind of good old Thatcherite economic approach. But if you're you know, doling out 150 billion pounds, which is about three times the size of the UK defense budget, then promising tax cuts, then also promising, I think this is something most Americans would support, increasing defense spending to 3%. There's a lot of questions on how this will be paid for, given uh, also the rough economic situation uh, caused by Brexit, where suddenly your largest trading partner, the EU, it's much more difficult to trade and trade is collapsing when it comes to the EU, or at least uh, significantly worsening than what it was before. So this is a real economic storm, and it's sort of difficult to see how these all add up. I guess they should have thought about that Brexit decision. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things it's a it's it's a chicken coming home to roost, no doubt. Where leaving the EU was treated as taking back control. The problem is for the UK is that the EU is an economy the size of the United States and China. So it is their the UK's largest trading partner, and what many businesses have found is that. It, suddenly doing trade with the EU is very difficult. And that has led to delays. You're, anytime that you have to deal with customs, agencies, export controls, all these other challenges of going into a market of which you're not part of. And I think what some times conservative voters forget that Margaret Thatcher was actually a major catalyst of the single European act, which was really pushing the EU to create or the European community at the time, a common European market that would enable trade to flow. It was, you know, the EU on the one hand creates a lot of regulations, a lot of regulatory burdens, but those regulations are to create a common market. So goods can flow, people can flow and UK left that. So that is going to cause tremendous uh, economic costs and the US UK free trade deal isn't anywhere. It's very hard to negotiate free trade deals with the rest of the world. So this has been a real struggle for the UK once they left the EU. And I think it's I, I think the, the chickens are coming home to roost when it comes to that. Well, as you pointed out, and as the Stark family says, winter is coming and Vladimir Putin is threatening to choke off gas and grain from all of Europe. And there's a major problem. What how is she going to even remain remotely politically popular if they're not able to, you know, heat their homes this winter? Yeah, I mean, this is a problem. We, we should be clear: it's not just uh, impacting the UK, but it's impacting all of Europe, where. The gas taps have been turned off by Russia, and this is Russia violating the contracts. This was one of the things that I think the, the German political leadership was actually quite smart about in not trying to provoke fights with uh, Russia over Nord Stream. They sent Nord Stream all the equipment, the turbines it needed to keep keep the gas flowing to Gazprom. And to make clear that it is Putin that is turning off the taps for this political reason, that it, it is not the fault of of the existing European governments, and perhaps the previous ones, that the gas from Russia is not not flowing. That this is a, a decision by Vladimir Putin. So what 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 is Europe and what does the UK do? Well, this is going to lead to uh, exorbitant costs for for consumers, but it's going to have to result in I think some of the things that we're already seeing, which is gas rationing, which is encouraging consumers to you know turn down the heat a bit from maybe you had it at a, at a comfy seventy five degrees during the winter. Winter, that's going to have to go down into the 60s, making sure that commercial buildings, when they're leaving their lights on all night, that they don't do that anymore. I and mean, we're talking about real 70s style uh, rationing in terms of energy. And then it requires doing whatever it takes in terms of getting energy supplies back on from LNG terminals. That's what we're seeing in, in Europe, getting coal 
fire power plants back up and running, which is a disaster for the for for climate. But it's one of those things that you kind of just need to do to get through winter. But then also, hopefully accelerating the clean energy transition. Renewables are the cheapest energy that you can buy and they can't deploy them fast enough. And I think that's there needs to be a real effort to really deploy renewable energy such that perhaps Europe will have a spike in fossil fuel use over the next couple of winters, but that will dramatically go down as clean energy supplies expand. But this is a struggle. This is why the United States have been warning Germany and other countries for years, if not decades, to not be dependent on Russian gas. And it's it's a tremendous problem. And you know we have to remember that Europe is fighting an energy war here with Russia. And while their, their military supplies to Ukraine might not be up to snuff, they are really bearing the economic costs of the war in Ukraine and of the effort to decouple with Russia. Another issue she's facing is the high, high cost of living in England. Anybody who's been to London can see that right away. I mean, just the cost of living in London alone makes New York and San Francisco and Washington, D.C. and L.A. look cheap. What is she going to do to bring those costs down so her people can you know, actually live reasonably well? Well, there's uh, lots of talk about perhaps looking at certain UK regulations about how land is is used. You know, housing costs have have skyrocketed. They have some of the similar issues that we have here in the US when it comes to housing, where it's very difficult to build. And some of that makes sense. You know, London is a historic city. You don't want to tear down all the buildings in central London. But finding ways to be able to build more, to make it easier to build, to expand housing is a, is a really urgent priority because you have this capital that is a huge economic engine, much like Silicon Valley, but it's incredibly hard to, to build housing. So I think there's a lot of energy and hope being put into perhaps looking at how land use can be restructured. There's a lot of hope that uh, Liz Truss is articulating about deregulating. I think there's perhaps clearly some efficiency gains that can be made. But I think some of this is going to be a long haul uh, effort. You're not going to suddenly turn the UK economy into, it's not going to be, suddenly become magically efficient, that it, this is an approach that will have to play out over, over the next decade. And so the short term gains here, I think, are, are going to be somewhat limited. How do you view her immediate political prospects? Do you think she's got an opportunity to get some early wins here and be successful? to really, you know, she's embracing Thatcherism. Do you think she can pull off the image of the Iron Lady? She already selected a cabinet, which is really interesting, you know, for the first time isn't dominated by white men. So that's got to be a step in the right direction in England. So what do you see as her prospects for actually succeeding and being popular? Yeah, I think she's she's taken a lot of positive steps with with her cabinet being the most diverse in history. Obviously, she's also the the third female prime minister of the UK, so uh, history making prime minister already. But I think she's got some real political challenges. So if you think about one of the things that Boris Johnson was able to do, and similar to kind of Donald Trump, in the sense that Donald Trump and Boris Johnson were both able to kind of break, you know, in Boris Johnson's case, the red wall of of the North, in Trump's case, able to break sort of the blue wall of, of, of you know, post-industrial or industrial states in the upper Midwest. And Liz Truss is sort of moving away from that, right? The embrace of Thatcher is not popular amongst a lot of Northern voters. And what was what Boris Johnson was able to do was have this kind of down home sort of uh, appeal, use Brexit as this real wedge issue within the Labour Party to appeal to those Northern voters to create sort of a broad coalition for conservatives. The challenge now for Liz Truss is going back to kind of a Thatcherist approach is A, that brings the, the Tory party sort of back to its traditional base, but it's lost a lot of voters in in the south of, of England that were, you know, remain voters, especially in London, uh, especially those along the coast that are feeling some of the effects of Brexit. And then, you know, so if you're moving away from taking some of the labor voters Keir Starmer looks like a safe pair of hands. So you have suddenly a Labour Party that is resurgent, that has moved away from some of the radicalism of, of Corbyn. And so if you're a middle-of-the-road voter, why would you go with Liz Truss when you look, when have someone like Keir Starmer that looks like kind of a, a guy that's up for it and, a, and, a, and a sort of a standard UK politician? So to me, Liz Truss is going to struggle with some of the same things that we're seeing in the, in the Republican Party today, where you have 
kind of an ideological faction where Brexit is sort of a way of, li way of life and Brexit becomes this sort of never ending quest. It's never, it's never realized there's always more Brexit to pur pursue more fights with the European Union to have. It's their totem. It, yeah, it's their totem versus many conservatives that want, that are, are of the kind of traditional Thatcherite mo mold of traditional small L liberal conservative wanting a smaller state deregulation, but also some of the things that are are, you know, freedom of migration, open trade that may not actually play well with the kind of cons far right conservative audience. So she's going to have this struggle between this kind of coalition within the conservative party, the same issues that Boris Johnson had and ultimately led to his downfall. So how does she navigate that? It's going to be a big challenge. And which is why I think you could see down the road fights with the EU, maybe not right away, but this need to sort of bring Brexit back might be something that she tries to bring back into, into politics, which then can be used by Labour and Keir Starmer and others to say, you know, we don't need this. That can appeal to kind of some voters that would be on the fence about her uh, to begin with. And there's already talk of Boris Johnson maybe mounting a comeback that if she becomes really unpopular. And so, you know, this is, we've had conservative, uh, the UK has had conservative rule for more than a decade. And it's just hard to maintain a coalition for that long. And labor looks like it's put together a pretty solid coalition and they're leading in all the polls. Now, the next election has to be before 2025. So they, she's got a couple years to go until she would have to go to the polls. But, you know, Labor's going to be demanding elections. Say so you weren't elected by the people. We need to have elections. And, and how long she's going to be able to withstand that, I think, is, a, is an open question. So what does this all mean for U.S.-U.K. relations, Biden administration, and trust? What does it mean for that? So I think the United States has demonstrated that we can work with any UK leader. And I think that was, you know, the, the, I, I was in the state department when Boris Johnson suddenly became foreign secretary right after Brexit. And John Kerry had the famous press conference with Boris Johnson after Johnson had said a lot of mean things about Barack Obama. And, you know, Kerry's response was just, you know, this is called diplomacy that, that you're our, you're <laughs> yeah. our, you know, our, our you know, closest ally. And I wouldn't say always has been our closest ally. We did fight a war against them to get our independence. But uh, the special relationship- Since then, it's been pretty good. It's been pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the special relationship is real. And Liz Truss on Ukraine, on Russia, on China, on defense is really well aligned with this administration. I think it's noteworthy that in her call with President Biden, that Biden raised the the concerns over uh, Northern Ireland, that you know we are a party to that agreement. The Good Friday Agreement was, we helped negotiate it. We are a strong believer in it. And part well, of- Biden the, personally was there. Personally there. Uh, feels very strongly about it. And, you know, part of the reason why the Northern Ireland agreement happened was because you had the UK and Ireland in the same political union in the EU. And so that sort of defanged the border issue. And so right now, Northern Ireland is somewhat benefiting from the current Northern Ireland protocol. They get to trade with the EU and with the UK that may make some loyalist voters unhappy in, in Northern Ireland, but in that creates some issues for UK conservatives, but this is a major issue for the United States. It's been one for Nancy Pelosi. So to me, I, I, I think, you know, Liz Truss would be smart to kind of prioritize having positive relations with the EU that would help relations with Washington. But if she doesn't, you know, the United States will still be there for the UK, but I think we'll, you know, that will lead to some estrangement. But I, I'm pretty hopeful that, look, we have big issues on China, big issues with Ukraine and Russia, and Liz Truss has been a leader on that. And I think that will really cement a strong relationship going forward. Max, thank you so much for helping us get to the truth of the matter about this new change in leadership in the UK. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me, Andrew. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 